Dreams are significant to God, and in this section of the book of Genesis, chapter 40 and 41, we're looking at a series of dreams that have great meaning. In fact, they're part of what uh, helped to deliver the nation of Israel so that we could have Jesus Christ, the Messiah, down through the lineage. And we're looking at Foundations Revisited. Believe it or not, this is the 50th sermon. So we've been at this for a while. And God uses Joseph from prison before Pharaoh to accomplish his plan. From Genesis chapter 41, verses 1 through 38. Pharaoh had a dream, um, a, actually two dreams, two years later. Remember what happened? The cupbearer was in prison and he had a dream and Joseph was there and interpreted that uh, dream and also the baker was in prison. It went well for the cupbearer. You can go back and look at previous messages or read uh, Genesis chapter 40. It went well for the cupbearer. He was restored to service before Pharaoh. It didn't go so well uh, for the baker and uh, he was um, pretty much beheaded. We come to chapter 41 and it says, when two full years had passed, that is after the cupbearer and the uh, baker's dreams, Pharaoh had a dream. And here's the dream. He was standing by the Nile. When out of the river there came up seven cows, sleek and fat. Now you and I don't usually think about sleek as being a um, kind of bountiful word, but that's what it means here. These were very well-nourished cows, and they grazed among the reeds. After them, seven other cows, I love the way the scripture puts it, they were ugly and gaunt. Uh, they were skinny, uh, little malnourished cows, and they came up out of the Nile, there in Egypt, the river, and stood beside those on the riverbank. And the cows that were ugly and gaunt ate up the seven sleek fat cows. Then Pharaoh woke up. That was his first dream. Bible Knowledge Commentary says, cows like to stand half submerged in the Nile among its reeds in, ref in refuge from the heat and the flies. Then they come up out of the water for pasture. Now, we should know that. Living in Bradford County, Pennsylvania, when we moved here about 14 years ago, there were more cows in the county than people. I don't know if that's still the case, uh, but there were many, many dairy uh, cows and dairy farms around and uh, other uh, types of uh, beef farms. And so this was the habit, particularly in Egypt where it was really hot. So they would go down to the Nile River and they would stand half submerged in the, the water um, and they would uh, get some refuge from the heat and the, the flies. The second dream that Pharaoh had he fell asleep again and had a second dream. Seven heads of grain, healthy and good, were growing on a single stalk. After them, seven other heads of grain sprouted, thin and scorched by the east wind. The thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven healthy, full heads. Then Pharaoh woke up, and it had been a dream. I, I think about this. Um, at our house, we have uh, what was a dog run. Now, all of our dogs have passed away, and so we no longer have any dogs. But right now, in the middle of the dog run, there's grass there, and one single stalk of corn has decided to grow. It wasn't planted, it got blown there or something, and it's, it's growing up. And the other thing that happens is right out in front of that dog run, there's fencing, and along that fencing, every year, without doing any work at all, pumpkins grow. 
We had them one year, they're back every year. And I, I think Sabrina got like 30 pumpkins off of it last year. Uh, so these things do happen. And so in his dream, because it's an agricultural society and uh, agrarian, and they had sheep and cattle and other things in Egypt, and then, then they would plant, even though it's a, a desert area, but they would plant along the Nile because the Nile uh, would produce some fertile uh, soil around there. And so he had this second dream about the heads of grain, healthy, and seven other heads that of grain that sprouted, and they were thin and scorched by the east wind. And again, just like the cows, the thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven healthy full heads. There are the two things that are unnatural in these dreams, okay? Fat cows don't eat skinny cows. You know, they eat grain and corn and other things like that. But this was for God's purposes for Pharaoh to see this. And there were many magicians and wise men in Egypt, but they couldn't interpret Pharaoh's dream. He had all kinds of sorcerers and magic and wise men surrounding him, uh, giving him wisdom. They were steeped in astrology and other things. And the scripture in verse 8 says, In the morning his mind was troubled, just bothered Pharaoh. This must have been quite a dream because you and I have dreams and, and we wake up and we go on with our day. Oftentimes we don't think anything of it. But God intended that this one would trouble Pharaoh. So he sent for all the magicians and wise men of Egypt. And Pharaoh told them his dream. But no one could interpret them for him. The magicians, Bible Knowledge Commentary, belong to a guild expert in handling the ritual books of magic and priestcraft. This was a whole cult issue. However, they could not interpret Pharaoh's dreams. A later guild of wise men in Babylon also would be unable to interpret a king's dreams. Before we go on, who was the one who interpreted them over the Babylonian magicians? It's there on your screen. It was Daniel. And God would use another Hebrew slave. Remember, Daniel and Ezekiel were taken into captivity um, in 686 BC to Babylon under uh, Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, basically, he was a prisoner of the state of uh, Babylon there at the time, or the city of Babylon. And uh, God used Daniel to show that no matter how powerful a nation might be, it is still not beyond God's sovereign control. And we need to remind ourselves of that. Politicians need to remind themselves of that. We're not in control. I love what Jerry often says in his prayer requests. We're not in charge here, right? God's in charge. And you and I know it because we're people of faith. And sometimes we fight against that. Sometimes we live our lives like we're in charge. But in general, because you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, you kind of back away and you say, God, not my will, but your will. But nations need to do that. The Roman nation needed to do that. The Caesars needed to do that. The Babylonians needed to do that. Every country in the world needs to bow, their leadership needs to bow to the sovereign God and control. And where you have problems are those atheistic countries, those who feel like Caesar, that they are God and that they don't need any God. But what's also trouble is our nation. Because, you know, we'll put on the dollar bill in God we trust. I happened to be going through Tawanda and I saw very interestingly, and I'm surprised no one has objected to it yet, on the sheriff's car. It says, in God we trust. Why hasn't someone complained about having that removed? Because it's a public tax dollar religious symbol. Now I hope nobody does. If you're looking at this broadcast, don't even consider it. But the reality is, oftentimes in our nation, we put those slogans up, but 
They're not really characteristic of us. You talk to a politician, and they'll say, God bless you, and maybe God uh, be in control and stuff like that. But unless they're really Christian, they're running the show themselves. And that's, and that's a problem, because whenever mankind runs the show, what happens? We steer the wrong way. You know, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. There's a sense in which people who become career politicians or leaders or Caesars or whatever, it goes to their head and they think that they're in charge and God's not sovereignly in control. But the proof of it is that these leaders could not interpret their own dreams. They could not steer the ship of their countries. Pharaoh couldn't do it. Nebuchadnezzar couldn't do it in Daniel's day. And God uses a slave like Joseph or a slave like Daniel, someone in captivity, to be able to do his will and reaffirm that he is sovereign. Now, after two years, about the time of Pharaoh's dream, the cupbearer remembers Joseph. Remember in chapter 40, Joseph said, remember me, right? When, when you're set free, because this is what your dream means, you're going to be set free, remember me to Pharaoh so that I can get out of this prison. Because what's Joseph still doing? Everything in Joseph's life is on hold because he's in prison unjustly. Verse 9, then the chief cupbearer cup said to Pharaoh, today I am reminded of my shortcomings, two years worth. Hmm. Oh, by the way, two years ago, I met a guy who could interpret dreams. He told me to uh, remember him before Pharaoh. It's just dawning on me now in these two years. What do you think that cupbearer was doing? He was all caught up in the fact that he was restored. Pharaoh was once angry with his servants, and he imprisoned me and the chief baker. He's going back to a little bit of history. In the house of the captain of the guard. And each of us had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. So the cupbearer is saying, yes, I know someone that can do this. Now, verse 12, a young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. And we told him our dreams. And he interpreted them for us, giving each man the interpretation of his dream. Do you remember what Joseph said back in chapter 40? What he said to the cupbearer, what he said to the baker is, I can't interpret dreams. But God can show me the interpretation. He always gave credit to God. Joseph was a tremendous man of faith. And things turned out exactly as he interpreted them to us. I was restored to my position, and the other man was impaled. How do you like that? He's being honest. Pharaoh sends for Joseph. And again, as always, Joseph gives God the credit. If you give God the credit in your life, you untie God's hands to bless you. There's no limit to what he can do. But if you take the credit, like I thought to myself, I was praying about this sermon, and I said, you know, Lord, today I really want to have some fun with this sermon. I really want to uh, uh, do a great job. But you know what? Apart from the Holy Spirit, that's impossible. I can't open your mind. I can't produce a sermon. I can do the research. I can do the study. I can be responsible. But I really can't make anything happen. I can't accomplish any change in your life. And that's why people in churches come week after week after week for 30, 40 years, or they drift away, and they say to themselves, you know, nothing's changed. What's different? Well, unless God does it, it'll never happen. Unless God increases your faith, unless God sets your mind about him, unless God takes over our leadership, our governments, those enemies around the world where there are dictators, 
And because Satan is so much at work, that may not happen. God allows that to not happen in our world and in our cultures. And that's the reason our world is so messed up. Not only the fact that we're fallen, not only the fact that we're broken, but just the fact that God lets willful people do willful things. And he lets dictators and tyrants rule. And when you get to heaven, you can ask God why he allows that. But you know what? This is not heaven on earth. It never will be. That's why God has us look to eternity. That's why God has us look to heaven. Because as the old hymn goes, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. And that's what you and I are doing. We're pilgrims passing through wayfarers, strangers on this earth, passing through, trying to have, by the Spirit of God, an influence for the Lord Jesus Christ, since we belong to him. So Pharaoh sends for Joseph, verse 14. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. And when he had shaved and changed his clothes, which was a common custom, if you're going to appear before the king, if you're going to appear before Pharaoh, when he did that, he came before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, and no one can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Now, I don't know how long the pause was after this statement, but Joseph said, I cannot do it. If the pause was too long, he would have lost his head. Do you understand where I'm going? He said, I can't do it. Well, it would be either back to prison or execution. Now, I'm hoping that pause wasn't real long or that Pharaoh was a little patient. But Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Now, can you imagine if that came up in our culture and one of our world leaders said, I had a dream. Okay, there's this Christian who can interpret dreams. And that person appears before this world leader and says, I can't do it, but God will give an answer. Now, in our culture, more than likely, what that Christian might say is, oh, I can do it, and leave God completely out of the picture. Do you know why? Because it's not politically correct to go before world leaders, officials in government, or our culture, and say, you know what? God will give me an answer. God can answer. But God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Pharaoh retells his dream to Joseph. And here it is again. Pharaoh said to Joseph, in my dream, I was standing on the bank of the Nile. We covered this. When out of the river, when out of the river, there came up seven cows, fat and sleek, and they grazed among the reeds. After them, seven other cows came, scrawny and very ugly and lean. A little bit of change in the wording. Before they were ugly and gone. Now they're scrawny and very ugly and lean. I had never seen such ugly cows in all the land of Egypt. They must have been hideous. I would compare them to creepy clowns. You know, some of you, have you seen? There are good clowns, but then there are creepy clowns. And they kind of scare everybody. Scrawny and very ugly and lean. And I had never seen such ugly clow clowns Cows! I'll get it. They're not clowns. They're, they're ugly cows in all the land of Egypt. I told you I want to have fun, have fun with this message. The lean, ugly cows ate up the seven fat cows that came up first. But even after they ate them, no one could tell 
that they had done so, they looked just as ugly as before. He's, you know, this is a, a, a little bit of interpretation with Pharaoh's dream. And then I woke up. But even though they ate the fat cows, it didn't improve their condition. And in my dream, I saw seven heads of grain, full and good, growing on a single stalk. After them, seven other heads sprouted, withered and thin and scorched by the east wind. The thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven good heads. And I told this to the magicians, but none of them could explain it to me. And then Joseph, by God's help, interprets the dream. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one and the same. And God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. Pharaoh, this dream was sent by God to explain what's going to happen to Egypt in the future. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heads of grain are seven years. Incidentally, one of the ways that you interpret scripture is with scripture. Now, would you think the seven good cows are seven years? Now, could that be 7,000 years? Because it says a day with the Lord is like a thousand years. Well, you don't go over there to interpret this passage. This passage interprets itself. And Joseph said, those seven cows represent seven literal years in Egypt. And the seven good heads of grain are seven years. And it is one and the same dream. So there's seven years. The seven lean, ugly cows that came up afterwards are seven years as well. And so are the seven worthless heads of grain scorched by the east wind. So there's going to be 14 years, seven years of good, plenty, and seven years of famine. And it, the passage interprets itself. These are seven years of famine. And then he says, this is what God is about to do. It is just as I said to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will follow them. This is what's going to happen. Then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten and the famine will ravage the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered because the famine that follows it will be so severe. So God warned Pharaoh through this dream and was using Joseph to get him out of prison and to rescue a nation, which we will see. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God and God will do so. So there were the cows and the grain and God says, I mean business, there's gonna be a famine for seven, uh, plenty for seven years, but then there's gonna be a famine that's going to affect you for seven years. And so Joseph advised to Pharaoh to preserve Egypt, and also it would preserve Joseph's family. Verse 33, and now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man. And I don't think Joseph was raising his hand saying, pick me, pick me, pick me. I don't think he was too humble for that. He was just interpreting the dream. Look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh appoint commissions over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. Good plan. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. So here's not only the interpretation of the dream, but a suggested plan. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt so that the country may not be ruined by the famine. Incidentally, it is this famine and the famine in Egypt that ends up getting the rest of Joseph's family down with him. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his officials, so Pharaoh asked them, can we find anyone like this man one in whom is the Spirit of God. He recognized that God was working in Joseph. 
God, God is at work even when it seems like it takes a long time. And we're going to find out that Pharaoh chooses Joseph, brings him out of prison, and we'll find that next week, brings him out of prison and sets him over as the quartermaster or the steward of this grain for the next 14 years. So Joseph's life is turning around a little bit, but also God is working in the nation. Faith and patience, I'm suggesting, are important in waiting on God. How long? How long? Had Joseph been down there in Egypt as a slave, how much of it had been in prison and now 14 years of patience and planning? This was a large part of his life. We saw that with the other patriarchs. We saw it with Jacob waiting 20 years to get back into the land. Faith and patience are important in waiting on God. You might have something that's going on with you, and you know what? You've prayed for it for 30 years. I had a professor in college, or in seminary. He was down in Texas. His dad, who was not a believer, was in Philadelphia. This was a Philadelphia boy. And great professor, wonderful, has gone home to be with the Lord now. But this guy had been praying for probably 30 years for his dad to come to Christ. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. He kept praying. Nothing happened. One day, his dad was standing at a bus stop somewhere around the Philadelphia area. And a pastor happened to be there at the time happened to strike up a conversation, happened to talk to him about the Lord Jesus Christ, and on that day, he trusted Christ as his Savior. 30 years of praying for his dad. So faith and patience are important in waiting on God. And God will use the difficult to get you ready for his good. It's going to all be good in the future, but you've got to go through the difficult now. And it might be unbearingly difficult for you at times. But just remember, for believers, God is working all things together for good. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, we give you thanks. You give us these stories as the foundations for society to know how we should run government, to know how we should live our lives to know how active the sovereign God is in steering and controlling not just our individual lives and our circumstances, but nations around the world. And Lord, yes, you allow tyrants and despots for a temporary time. But your heart yearns for every tyrant to turn to you. And some will not. But even beyond that, your heart yearns for Christians, average people, and leaders in our country to turn to you and let you lead. And the Bible is full of all the principles we need. I know we rebel against that in our nation. It is amazing to me, Lord, some of the content that we can allow our children to see and demonstrate in school. And yet, they would be barred from reading the Bible. They would be barred from a teacher sharing a verse or a prayer. That's amazing to me. And then we wonder why our education system, why our society is crumbling, because we've abandoned your principles. Help us who are of faith to continue that faith and that patience that we need. In Jesus' name, amen.